Hello, everybody, to the next webinar organized by Princeton University's Brendan Center for Finance. We're very happy to have Daryl Duffy with us today. Hi, Daryl. Uh, today, Daryl will talk about how to redesign the US Treasury market, what has to be fixed, and what you know, are the challenging features we are facing. And before we go to Daryl's presentation, I would like to do some housekeeping as usual and do some advertising what we had before and uh, which other webinars are coming up. So today, Daryl will talk about the US market, the treasuries market. Last Monday, Bill Dudley, the former president of the New York Fed, was talking about the longer run challenges for the Federal Reserve System. Next Monday, given the current circumstances, Lisa Cook will talk about the economic and social implications of racial disparities. So it should be very timely and a very interesting perspective from an economist who is focusing on racial disparities. And then next Friday, Ken Rogoff will talk about global sovereign debt. That default might come up very prominently down the road and also the role of the dollar post COVID. So we have many more speakers. Here's just a picture of most of the speakers uh, coming up and have been there. And um, we hope you will stay with us and watch many, many more, whether on YouTube or on Zoom or in any other device. Now, let me go to the treasury market. That's what Daryl will talk about today. It's a huge market, it's about $18 trillion uh, market. It's a safe haven. It's probably uh, the biggest safe haven market uh, in the world, or it is. And I want to show here the yield, the development of the yield. Everybody knows that the Fed was cutting the interest rates, bringing the yield down. But the interesting thing is that in March, there was the 10-year yield was suddenly going up dramatically. And this is a dramatic move uh, compared to the long run, what you expect when the Fed is cutting the interest rate. So the yield went up and Daryl will tell us why and what happened. And at the same time, also the bid ask spread was very high. So on March 18th this year in 2020, the bid ask spread was eight, 48 uh, basis points. And usually it's about one or two, it's a very low basis point. So it's a very, very dramatic difference from the usual way of this market, how this market functions. And we would like to learn from Daryl, you know, what went wrong, what can be improved and so forth. Now, in our view, I think it's, or in my view, there are two liquidity concepts interacting. I've worked on that with Lars Peterson, that's Daryl's former student, um, where the funding liquidity, you know, if you want to raise funds, the government wants to issue some bonds at a very low interest rate, that's one element, or also the market makers would like to issue some funds and get some funding, or firms, that's the funding liquidity. And the market liquidity interacts, where the market liquidity is essentially what, at what price can you sell? What's the bid ask spread or the volume or the turnover? Of what's going on at that time? Is the market liquidity high? That means the bid ask spread will be very low. So in this cases where the market, the bid ask spread was very, very high, dramatically high, the market liquidity was very low. And of course, depending how easily the market makers in these markets can fund themselves or have some resources on their own, they will bring the spread down. If not, if they don't have resources, if they're scared, but then the bid ask spread will widen. Now, what's market making? And as I indicated already, what's really important for market making is the funding of the market makers, the risk bearing cap capital, so how much capital do they have, and also the regulatory capital. If they have to put a lot of costly equity capital aside for regulatory reasons, then they might not be so eager to do this market making in the treasuries markets. And with Basel III, there came essentially the new rule or a traditional rule came back. So we went back whole circle from Basel I to Basel III that you have this leverage ratio. So the leverage ratio said that independently of how risky the assets are you hold, you cannot have a, a leverage ratio beyond a certain level. And that means even though you hold US treasuries, which are not very risky, you have to hold enough equity and holding equity is very costly. So that's one thing and I will come back in the poll question. You know, what do you think, you know, how important is this uh, leverage ratio or the regulatory framework in general? Then the second component is, you know, the plumbing of the market, of the market making, who are the market makers, how they interact, what's the network? And we saw a big shift from you know being the large banks in market makers to hedge funds being market makers and other things and Daryl will talk more about this as well. 
I would also mention one concept Boita and Siebert introduced in 2007, this market maker of last resort for a central bank. And it's different from the lender of last resort where the central bank you know, helps out uh, banks which have some problems because of some maturity mismatch. Here it is the case that the central bank steps into the market and becomes a market maker. And if you go back in the history of central banks, uh, many central banks were initially founded to become debt management offices. You know, the Bank of England and other banks were essentially founded to manage the government debt and become market makers, not of last resort, but just reducing or improving market liquidity of a sovereign debt. And the question is, you know, should the central banks become more active again in this dimension or less active, um, becoming market makers of last resort? And of course, what the Fed did, that the two programs in particular, they were very much purchasing some 10 year treasuries or other off the run treasuries and swapping it for reserves. So they can think of a reserve as a console bond with a floating interest rate. So these days we have this new framework. It's essentially reserves is like a console bond. You never have to pay back any principal, but the interest you pay, the Fed is determining on its own as well. So it's a floating interest rate. And and the second program the Fed introduced, and I think Repo uh, and Daryl will talk more about the repo facility for foreign central banks to use the treasuries and, and repo it with the Federal Reserve. So instead of selling it, you can go to the Fed as a foreign central bank and repo it out and get some dollar reserves directly and uh, give the treasuries, the 10-year treasuries, a collateral to the Federal Reserve. So I want to stop with a poll as usual in this introductions with three questions and I'm curious what the audience thinks. The first thing question is, should we fundamentally rethink financial regulation? For example, the leverage ratio and other aspects. Is there a lot of room for improvement? Or do you think the current framework we have now worked on for 10 years after the global financial crisis, that's a pretty stable framework and the, fun, the big problems right now are not in the financial sector. They might result in the financial sector down the road, but the initial problems were not coming from the financial sector. So I would like to get a, a, a sense what the audience thinks. And the second question is, should central banks act as a market maker of last resort? Should they always do it and be always present in this market as an additional stabilizing force? or occasionally only in crisis times when the bid ask spread widens dramatically, or they should always stay out of it because otherwise, you know, there's moral hazard considerations and other considerations. So I would like to get a, a take on that. And then the third question would be, does the treasury market needs to be redesigned? And if, let's suppose it does, should it be done, should it be organized by private market players? or should the official sector be always involved? So it's related to question two, but to what extent should then in more generally, not only as market maker of last resort, should the official sector uh, be very involved and engaged how to design it, how do they redesign uh, the treasury market? So the, I'm curious to hear what, what you think about these questions. And let me just um, see what the outcome is. So let me just say that should we fundamentally rethink regulation, actually 83% think we should do that. That's a high number. And uh, only 17% think uh, we should not. The current framework is adequate. Uh, then should central banks act as a market maker of last resort? The majority, 81% think occasionally, and only 13% think it's always, they should always act as a market maker of last resort, and only 6% think they should never uh, be active as a market maker of last resort. So it's a very clear uh, direction. And the third question is also very clear. 87% uh, think the official sector should be involved in the redesigning of the market make, uh, treasury market. Uh, and it should not only be left to the private players. So with this, I will uh, pass on the floor to Daryl for his inside to pull talk. And I uh, thanks, Marcus. Thanks. Uh, well, before I begin, uh, begin just uh, walking through uh, what happened and what might be done uh, consistent with your poll, uh, 
Uh, first, I want to thank you, of course, uh, for inviting me to do this. I looked at your list of participants, and uh, it's an amazing opportunity to uh, participate in such a prestigious uh, series. So thank you. Thank you for that. And it's a very uh, good time uh, to talk about these issues, about what happened in the treasury market, to try to understand uh, what happened, what went wrong, and uh, to discuss what might be done about it. And that's going to be the main focus, is try to diagnose what happened, uh, uh, not just you know who lost money, but uh, what should we do about it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start to share a screen, and I'm going to walk through um, what exactly happened in March uh, when the COVID crisis hit and uh, many investors decided that they needed to get liquidity uh, using their treasuries, which are a wonderful source of liquidity. And as you mentioned, the treasury market is historically the safe haven, not just for US investors, but around the world. Uh, and as you pointed out, the treasury market didn't perform as it normally does in an extreme stress period. There were, it wobbled badly, became dysfunctional. The Fed had to rescue it. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about the historical precedents for that. And the poll, the poll that you asked about whether the Fed should do that occasionally, uh, uh, never or almost always, well, I'm going to come back to that. I, I might differ from... Uh, from the average response in your poll, because I do think that the Fed always needs to be there. It's the traditional role of the central bank to act as a last resort. Um, but, and here's the, maybe that's what your poll respondents indicated, but we should design the treasury market and regulations so that the frequency with which that happens is extremely small because it, it does present a moral hazard as you pointed out. Uh, let's see if I can advance. So just briefly what happened uh, at, at a high level, and then we'll dive into the details. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the terrible macroeconomic impacts of the COVID crisis became apparent to investors around the world um, around the beginning of March and caused enormous uh, liquidations of treasury positions. It hasn't been fully diagnosed who is exactly liquidating. I'm going to get uh, back to that later, but it looks like a very large hedge funds, and probably some foreign official sector accounts, possibly foreign central banks uh, that were managing their foreign exchange reserves to support either their local banks uh, with dollar funding or uh, to support their currency prices. It, uh, unfortunately, this market uh, relies almost entirely on the balance sheets of a very small number of dealers. Think of them as the primary dealers in the US Treasury market. Now, I'm talking about the secondary market in which treasuries are traded rather than the primary market in which they're auctioned. And when those uh, very large investors uh, sold treasuries, someone had to purchase them, but to get to the purchasers, the flows had to go through the dealer balance sheets. And that's gonna be the main uh, concern that, uh, that we're gonna discuss today. And so you can think of a herd of elephants all charging for the same uh, uh, small uh, door, a little, a little door in your home, they're definitely going to have trouble getting through that little door, which is the dealer balance sheets. So what happened? The market choked on this, uh, on this surge in demand for liquidity. Bid-ask spreads uh, that were offered by dealers to their customers widened by a factor of more than 10. I'll show you the data. Uh, in the interdealer market, which uh, intermediates treasuries among dealers, order book depth dropped by a factor of more than 10. And I'll show you some data from JP Morgan on that. That's recently been buttressed from uh, Michael Fleming at the New York Fed. The yield curve went completely out of shape. Uh, the yields of treasuries of nearby maturities were no longer near each other. Uh, so basically, um, uh, off the runs and on the runs uh, looked like they were being priced uh, inconsistently or at least with very low substitution possibilities uh, between them. And uh, in a massive uh, arbitrage involving the cash treasuries market and the futures market for treasuries, the 
a basis, the difference in price um, that should have been zero, uh, that the difference uh, blew up and that itself caused a big unwind, which we'll talk about. This was not only a, a symptom of the problem, it was actually a partial cause of the problem as large hedge funds unwound, unwound their cash futures basis trades, causing a lot of sales and off the run treasury securities as a result got particularly mispriced. Can you explain the cash basis trade just for the average viewer? Yeah, in fact, I, I'm gonna go do that. I'm gonna do that in a few slides in detail um, because I think it's quite, uh, it's quite, uh, uh, well, first of all, it's technically interesting, but, but as I said, it's also both a symptom and a cause of what happened in March. So the, the Central Bank of the United States, the Fed, did uh, step in. I wouldn't say so much as a dealer of last resort um, or even a liquidity provider in, a, in the sense that we normally discuss, like in your paper on funding liquidity and market liquidity. The, the Fed's reaction was not to replace the provision of liquidity uh, that dealers were offering, but rather just to take an enormous stock of treasuries out of the market so that the remaining stock of treasuries that had to be intermediated by dealers was much smaller. And it purchased in just the course of three weeks, a trillion dollars of treasuries. This is, this is um, in modern history, the largest and most aggressive short-term market operation that a central bank has ever conducted. And the Fed has kept purchasing more. I'll show you the numbers. In addition to that, when the repo market, which is used to finance treasuries uh, for dealers, uh, started to also become unhinged, the Fed stepped in and provided essentially unlimited trillions of dollars of funding to dealers for their treasuries. And um, a, as you indicated, uh, uh, the role of capital requirements, uh, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, the, the Fed exempted treasuries and uh, reserves from a key capital requirement called the supplementary leverage ratio rule. I'm gonna jump to the next slide uh, for, the, for the, I think for the most, um, uh, probably the most important um, perspective on what's been happening in this market that could cause it to become so dysfunctional. So this, this slide is gonna take me a couple of minutes, but um, it contains basically the main message uh, uh, of the paper that I wrote for Brookings at which I presented this last week. The vertical axis on this slide is in trillions of dollars. The horizontal axis uh, covers the time period from 1998 forward to projected results for 2025. The blue bars are the total marketable supply of US Treasury securities. So uh, as you can see, the United States has been spending money hand over fist. And in order to run those very large fiscal deficits, uh, almost by definition, the, uh, the deficits have to be financed in the form of additional treasury securities. And uh, in, the, in the current year, because of the enormous additional uh, fiscal deficits associated with the COVID crisis, uh, three and a half trillion and now there's a discussion of an additional trillion dollars in front of Congress, which I think we'll go through. Uh, the stock of treasuries outstanding is going to grow enormously over the next six years. These are based on projections from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, uh, which has provided reliable uh, forecasts of, uh, of fiscal uh, deficits uh, over the past years. So what you should take away from the blue bars is that uh, US debt to GDP is growing enormously and it's showing up in the form of a huge stock of treasury securities that needs to be intermediated somehow by the market because the flow of, of demand for treasury trades um, is basically commensurate with the size of the stock outstanding of treasuries. Now let's turn to the red bars. Um, these are the balance sheets, that is total assets, of the largest US bank holding companies uh, whose names are listed at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and these are basically the main providers of liquidity for the treasury market. 
And you can see there's two phases in the, uh, in, in the uh, growth of the red bars. There's the period leading up to the financial crisis of 2008, where the balance sheets of the largest dealers, uh, which are uh, divisions of these holding companies, uh, basically tripled uh, in the period covered by this slide up to the financial crisis. That happened for basically two main reasons. One, very low regulatory capital requirements. And number two, the presumption that these large banks were too big to fail, which meant that creditors were willing to lend them money at razor thin credit spreads in funding markets. So that cheap funding was basically a jet fuel uh, that uh, that uh, fueled the massive growth of these balance sheets. So dealers were willing to expand their balance sheets um, at, uh, to take you know, every possible minor uh, uh, trading opportunity. Post-crisis, as we know, uh, and you have, have written about, uh, Marcus, the uh, regulatory environment has changed. Now there's strong capital regulation, tr strong liquidity regulation, and moreover, the the, through the Basel process and internationally, the uh, regulators have sent the message that these large institutions are no longer too big to fail. Now, whether that, whether that uh, message has gotten through or, um, uh, remains to be seen. There are, we haven't really tested the resolve yet, but creditors definitely got the message because they're charging much higher credit spreads. The funding costs for growing balance sheets are enormous enormously higher now than they were before the crisis, roughly by a factor of two. So now step back and think about the blue bars versus the red bars. The trading of the, of the treasuries represented by the blue bars is going through the balance sheets of the firms whose, uh, whose assets are represented by the red bars. And you can see there's a mismatch here in the growth of these, of these, uh, of the ability of the uh, dealers to handle this enormous flow of treasury securities. Uh, and uh, going forward, we shouldn't be able to expect the same size balance sheets to, to effectively intermediate such large flows. They can do it on a normal day, as they have been most days, but when there's an episode of uh, surging uh, demand for liquidity, as we saw in March of this year on the COVID crisis, the dealers were just not up to the job and uh, the Fed had to step in. This is uh, another way of looking at it. This is the ratio of the outstanding uh, uh, um, stock of marketable treasuries. That's uh, the amount of treasuries available to the market to the amounts of treasuries that the dealers were financing on their balance sheets. And the dealers were keeping up with the market until the financial crisis. And then they basically fell out of ability to keep up and the stock of uh, treasuries outstanding grew uh, dramatically relative to their, uh, uh, to the dealer's financing capabilities. This is the uh, focusing in on the amount of treasuries that were financed by the dealers during the COVID period. Uh, this uh, shows the quantity of treasuries financed by dealers from the beginning of the year through the stress period in March. And you can see that you know, an excess of 500 billion growth uh, that had to be handled by treasuries in terms of getting financing. So it's not that the dealers stepped back. It's, they did perform their normal role of expanding um, inter their intermediation when the demands arrived. They didn't just say, no, uh, these treasuries are too risky. We stop. Uh, they did a lot, uh, but they came to a point at which they couldn't handle any more. You can see that also in this uh, plot of volumes of trade in the treasury market, which are shown in the vertical axis in trillions of dollars. And you can see that those volumes increased by in excess of 60% uh, from the months, uh, from the weeks before the March stress period uh, to the stress period in March itself. By the way, there's an interesting uh, new data series that's now available through FINRA called TRACE that gives us a very accurate picture of the total amount of treasuries traded, uh, broken into two segments, the interdealer segment in blue in this diagram and the dealer to customer segment in red. The way this market works is that uh, uh, dealers take requests for trade from customers to buy or to sell. And then when a dealer balance sheet becomes 
overloaded with certain treasuries, the dealers will lay off those positions in the interdealer market. Um, the green bars, which we have from uh, Fed data, go back further in history, uh, but are basically commensurate um, with, the, with the trace data from FINRA. You might say, well, how could it possibly be that the dealer amounts exceed the total amounts in certain weeks? Uh, that's because the dealer to dealer uh, trades are double counted because the dealers are self-reporting their own trades. So it's possible for the green bars to exceed the totals um, because of that double counting within the dealer to dealer trades. Can I ask some questions from the audience? Some people would like to know is it the high volume which was the problem or is it was it a one-sided market? Everybody wanted to sell. And the other question is Narayanan would like to know why didn't the hedge funds step up the plate at that time? When did... So those, those two questions go right to the heart of the, of the matter. Of course, in an efficient market, for every, even in an inefficient market, every time someone sells, someone else buys. So there was a balance of buy and sell, but every ultimate seller, in order to reach an ultimate buyer, had to first sell it to a dealer because this is a dealer intermediated market. And the dealer's balance sheets became stuffed. And in order to, for them to uh, perform the function of buying from the sellers and then selling to the buyers, those treasuries had to remain on the balance sheets of the dealers for at least a couple of days uh, on average. And just that short period of time, the pipeline effect overwhelmed the dealers and uh, and uh, the dealers started basically uh, to choke on the volume and, and, and limited the volume by uh, bid-ass spreads, which I will show you in a minute. Where were these, the massive volume of sales coming from? Uh, a lot of it was from the for, foreign held treasuries. So this is a histogram showing frequency uh, of months uh, for a certain amount of gross sales of US treasuries coming from foreign owners. And uh, you can see the typical monthly amount of gross sales is between one and one and a half trillion dollars. And if you look over far onto the right hand tail, you'll see one little red block that's March of this, of this year when a, by far a record amount of uh, foreign sales occurred. And it seems from anecdotal accounts that those were from both large offshore hedge funds, and also foreign official sector accounts, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So this, all of these sales had to find purchases, purchasers, as I mentioned earlier, but the only way for that to happen uh, was for them to first land on a dealer balance sheet. And, uh, and that is basically what, what choked the, uh, the market. And here's evidence of the market choking. This is from a speech by Lori Logan, who's the head of the Open Market Trading Desk at the New York Fed. This is, the, this is where all the action uh, happens at the New York Fed in terms of Fed. And they monitored the bid offer spreads that dealers were offering to their customers on Bloomberg. It's indexed at the beginning of the year to 100. And you can see that um, bid offer spreads remain stable until the COVID crisis broke. And then bid offer spreads widened by a factor of about 12 at the worst. So 12 times the bid offer spread, indicating basically the dealers were saying, okay, we handled a lot of increase in volume. To do any more, uh, we're only gonna do it if we get enormous compensation in terms of bid offer spread. This is the market depth in the interdealer market where dealers lay off positions with each other along with the help of high frequency trading firms called PTFs or principal trading firms. And normally the, this market is very deep uh, and it handles the on the run securities. So if you focus on the black line, you can see the depth of the market is around $175 million in terms of the best, uh, the amounts uh, available for sale at the best uh, three offer prices or the amounts available for purchase at the best three bid prices. So that's, that's a generous amount of depth, but when the COVID crisis hit, that depth plummeted by a factor of more than 10, because the interdealer market was also choking and nobody really wanted uh, to absorb a lot of flows at the, at the best prices. Uh, 
This is the cash futures basis trade that I promised to come back. Can I just ask some questions? Yeah, please. Um, can you explain who are these market makers? Who can become a market maker and who can't, cannot in this market? People would like to know. And are these market makers also active in other markets? It could be that it was choking somewhere else and then they had to free up, up some capacity for the other market. And that's why they couldn't do the treasury market. Did you see any of these spillovers or that was not the case? There, there was, I mean, it's the same dealers that were choking on the treasury trades that were also choking on the corporate bond trades. There are several really good papers about that. There's one by Maureen O'Hara and Alex Joe. Uh, there's a paper uh, by uh, uh, Valentin Haddad, uh, Tyler Muir, and other co-authors. There's a paper by Ben Lester at the Philadelphia Fed, Pierre-Olivier Vey, and several other authors all of whom show uh, basically evidence of the same thing happening to dealer balance sheets in the corporate bond market. I'm focusing today on treasuries because, <clears throat> because in my view, um, if you can't intermediate the US treasury market, it becomes a matter of national economic security. It's not just a matter of proper market functioning because the US needs to fund its deficits in this market. And because the treasuries market serves a, a role as we discussed of being a safe haven and a source of liquidity around the world. Let me show you this, um, this market, uh, which is the cash futures basis market. So what we're looking at on the vertical axis is the difference between two repo rates for one month uh, safe collateralized borrowing. One is the actual repo rate, the actual market quoted repo rate. The other is the implied repo rate that you would get if you synthesized a one month financing of treasuries with the purchase of cash treasury securities and the sale in the futures market on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange of treasuries. Now, uh, the law of one price uh, suggests that, that the difference in the two interest rates, uh, one being the actual repo rate, the other being the implied repo rate should be about zero in a well-functioning market and you can see it was about zero until the financial, the, until the stresses of the COVID crisis hit in early March. This particular um, uh, basis trade that is buy the cheap, sell the rich was being used extensively by large hedge funds as a way to store their cash. Why would they lend money in the ordinary repo rate market when they could lend money in the implied repo rate market at a higher rate? But just like what happened in, to LTCM in 1998, instead of the basis acting in their favor because they were earning a rent uh, for holding that position to maturity, the basis got even wider. And as it got wider, they, hedge funds had to put up more margin to cover the, uh, the move against them. And eventually they had to unwind their basis trades before maturity, losing money and causing this huge dislocation where you can see there were spikes in this basis of hundreds of basis points, meaning two different interest rates, both very safe, uh, were uh, for the same maturity, were differed, differing by hundreds of basis points, uh, indicating this functionality in the market. By the way, this diagram is from an excellent paper by Trimpf, Shin, and Trishko uh, from uh, BIS, and they were kind enough to lend me the data uh, to, to plot it for this uh, slide. Here's what the Fed did. Basically, it went in and just took treasuries out of the market. It was as simple as that. Using an auction-based approach, they weren't acting as a dealer of last resort, putting a bid in and offer into the market. They were just buying treasuries in enormous quantities. About a trillion dollars in the first uh, three weeks of this stress period. And then as you can see, they started to scale it down and they're still purchasing at a rate that's typical of one of their very large uh, uh, LSAP or quantitative easing programs uh, that occurred in the last 10 years. But during the first three weeks of this, it was, you know, it was QE uh, on steroids. It was just massively more than any uh, rate of purchase that ever acute, uh, occurred in any central bank's uh, quantitative easing program. And this was not, at least not uh, headlined as a way of controlling U.S. yields, uh, but rather simply of uh, provide, uh, trying to restore the market to liquidity, allowing dealers to continue to intermediate the market by taking treasuries out of the market. In addition to 
taking treasuries out of the market, as I mentioned, the dealer, the, the Fed um, provided financing to the dealers and basically said, any amount you want, we'll provide financing. And they also uh, eliminated the supplementary, uh, supplementary leverage ratio capital requirement for treasuries, which is a backstop capital requirement um, that had been impinging on the the appetite of dealers to intermediate this market because uh, the dealer, in order to provide the liquidity that the market needed, the, the dealers would have had to expand their positions in treasuries. Uh, and that in turn would have blown through their regulatory capital requirements. So that's post-crisis, the regulatory capital requirements are much more appropriate. They're keeping the largest banks in a much safer condition, which is higher priority even than this. Uh, but at the same time, um, they limit the appetite of the dealers to expand their balance sheets on short notice. And this is why I'm going to suggest a reform of this market that's not so reliant on dealer balance sheets. So let me do that right now. This is a good time to pause because I'm, we're going to get to, uh, in the last few minutes, a discussion of what do we do given that the dealers were unable to intermediate the surge in demands, uh, well, there are different, you know, this has happened before. There's, a, there's going to be a new book uh, by Kenneth Garbade, who's probably the leading historian of, uh, of the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the Treasuries market. He works at the New York Fed. And he shows that in, this happened three times in history. In 1938, uh, pardon me, in 1939, on the opening of the Second World War, the Treasury market again became dysfunctional, and the Fed swooped in and rescued the market. In 1958, uh, when uh, the Middle East uh, security uh, concerns uh, became very, very tense, and President Eisenhower sent Marines to Lebanon, Again, the treasury market became dysfunctional and the Fed again stepped in and bought a lot of treasuries uh, to support the liquidity in the market. And then in 1970, immediately after President Nixon announced the incursion of uh, US military forces from Vietnam into Cambodia and subsequently uh, tragic um, events occurred at Kent State University uh, associated with protests there, a bit reminiscent of recent uh, days here in the United States, the Treasury market again became dysfunctional and the Fed stepped in. So this March COVID crisis event was the fourth time in a century uh, that the Fed has had to rescue the market from dysfunctionality. This is not about monetary policy and supporting the prices of Treasuries to ease interest rates for the macro economy. This is basically to ensure that the treasury market remains functional. The, the point of the first slide that I showed is that we can expect these episodic surges of illiquidity in the future unless we restructure this market so that it's not so dependent on dealer balance sheets. So let me, let me explain that in the last uh, few minutes. This can is I the- Go ahead, Mark. Another question from Marco Bassetto. You would like to distinguish between two stories. One story is that the dealers didn't have enough balance sheet capacity essentially to intermediate the large volume. That's what you pushed. And the other thing is that lots of people are trying to sell and, and essentially prices move so dramatically and suddenly volatility shoots up and uh, that causes a bit of bad moving up in a closed milligram type uh, framework. Um, how would you, would you say the former one is the more plausible one or the, the latter one? It's just uh, okay, so in a sense. Yeah, this is where the backdrop of the financial crisis of 2008 might come to mind. In that financial crisis, the macroeconomic news was desperately bad, uh, but the, the treasury yields went down and stayed down. Uh, the, the bad news usually doesn't cause treasury yield volatility. All of the indications that I gave earlier were that the, basically, the problem with the yields, the yield volatility was caused by the inability of the dealer intermediated market to digest the enormous flows. Uh, 
rather than the macroeconomic news causing, let's say, uncertainty about the ability of the United States to pay off its debt or uncertainty about future inflation. Now, others may follow with proper uh, empirical analysis, uh, but I think the, the, the clearest indications that we have at this point are that this was not a concern that US Treasury securities were fundamentally unsound in terms of the fiscal uh, space of the United States or that inflation was about, uh, was becoming extremely uncertain, but rather simply uh, that the dealers um, choked on, on these massive flows. And all of the evidence seems to point in that direction. But I'd be interested in seeing uh, uh, what others may find about that. Okay, so what I'm gonna suggest in the next few slides is rather than relaxing capital requirements so that uh, dealers are happy to expand their balance sheets at a moment's notice to absorb these flows. Uh, we don't want to do that because we want the banks to be safe and a source of strength to the market as, as they have been in, in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in recent years uh, with strong balance sheets. Instead, we want to, I, I would say, my view is that we would want to reform the structure of the market, the design of the U.S. Treasury market, so that it's no longer the case uh, that so much dealer balance sheet needs to be used to intermediate the market. And uh, I have one uh, proposal uh, that I would like to discuss for how to do that. And it's based on the fact that uh, the amount of central clearing in this market is extremely low. And let me explain that because it's I think uh, it's, it's right at the, it's a plumbing issue, but it's a plumbing issue with great economic significance. So here's the current uh, approach in the US Treasury market to guaranteeing the settlement of a trade. Um, settlement means when you buy securities, you have to pay with cash and you receive the securities. That settlement occurs a day after the trade is agreed. And in the meantime, both the buyer and the seller are exposed to each other they have to keep space on their balance sheet to make the settlement the next day. And they have to make sure that they have the liquidity necessary to do that. That's expensive in terms of a commitment uh, um, uh, to, um, to this settlement that takes up space on balance sheets. So as you can see in this diagram, settlement between the customers shown in blue and the dealers shown in green is directly to each other uh, through their own banks. There's no, um, there's no market infrastructure like there is for exchange trading of equities that sends these trades to a clearinghouse and guarantees them. In the interdealer market, however, when two dealers trade with each other, the norm uh, would be that they would each novate their trade to a central counterparty shown as that red rectangle in the middle which would become the buyer to the original seller and becomes the seller to the original buyer. So immediately the dealer's exposures to each other is eliminated. And importantly for what we're discussing today, the dealers get to net their purchases against their sales at the central counterparty. So for example, if dealer one bought 120 billion today from dealer two and sold 150 billion today uh, to dealer three, that gross commitment to settle of $270 uh, billion would turn into a net commitment to uh, the CCP of only 30 billion. Now that's just a numerical example, but you can see that these large, large settlement commitments, which take up space can be crushed down by central clearing. The unfortunate thing is that in the, the current structure of the market, uh, you are facing the CCP for settlement on only 22% of trades done in the treasury market. And the other 77% or 78%, you're facing a uh, bilateral counterparty, which entails settlement risk and also means that you don't uh, get to net down your gross purchases and sales. And so it's very inefficient to run the market this way. And it's been proposed by a number of industry groups and in testimony to Congress and been discussed in government reports that we should go to a system more like this one, 
in which once a trade occurs between two parties in the market, whether the blue dots or the green dots, the trade is novated to the CCP so that we get immediate netting, reducing the amount of cash that you need uh, for settlement, reducing the amount of treasuries that you need for settlement on your balance sheets. This has the additional advantage of improving safety of the settlements in the market and also allows for the possibility of all to all trade in the future because you can't have exchange based trade in, in a market unless you have central clearing, as we have, for example, in the futures market, in the swaps market, uh, and in the equities market. So a movement to central clearing would open the door to exchange operators that could step in and say, hey, we don't need to have every trade go through a dealer balance sheet. We could have, some, in some cases, um, uh, an insurance company could buy directly from a hedge fund or a dealer uh, could intermediate that when the trade is large enough or some of the trade, but doesn't need to be there for every trade. And that also reduces the extensive use of dealer balance sheet space to intermediate this market and would allow the growth of the treasuries market on even on a limited amount of dealer balance sheet space as all to all trade uh, uh, if, it, if it were to take hold. So there's two, again, two main benefits, uh, reducing the amount of settlements to be done, saving balance sheet space, even if you stay in a dealer intermediated market. And secondly, opening up the possibility of disintermediating dealers for some fraction of the trade, never requiring dealer balance sheet space. In addition to that, of course, then there's the safety issue uh, regarding settlement risk uh, that you also improve. So Perl, uh, Noga Kotlis would like to know, so why isn't it done this way? What prevents the system from going through CCPs? Is there some legal issue or is there the big banks don't like it or what's the problem? This is a tragedy of the commons. It's in the interests of many uh, many market participants to have this occur. And it's been discussed by many market participants, including the Treasury Markets Practices Group, which is a collection of dealers and non-dealer firms that are active in the market. Unfortunately, as in a tragedy of the commons, it even if there's a benefit to all, it's not necessarily the case that any individual market participant or even groups of market participants we're, are willing to bear the cost necessary to make it happen. There's a further uh, market failure in that if I were a dealer in this market, I would not prefer this setup. I would prefer the previous one uh, because then um, I don't need to worry about being disintermediated. And if dealers are important in designing this market, which they are, then acting on their own, they're unlikely to support, it's as a matter of business, unlikely to support a transition to uh, this market structure, which, uh, which would possibly incite disintermediation. So this is a clear role for the official sector. It's a public good that the official sector uh, can provide by mandating central clearing and possibly contributing to the infrastructure uh, for central clearing. Uh, it's not going to happen if the private sector, if it's left to the private sector, and it has been openly discussed and not and it's not happened in the private sector alone. So another question is, is, where's the Fed in this picture? Somebody would like to know. And the other question is, how is it done in other countries like the German Bund or the Japanese uh, JTBs? Uh, do they have the same problems or they have mandated uh, CCP arrangements? Uh, it's not mandated. And uh, there, there is to some extent uh, central clearing of government securities trade in Europe more so than in the Un more so than in the United States, um, but I wouldn't say that this problem is limited to the U.S. And in fact, in March, we saw a number of countries in which uh, the government securities markets froze; they were unable to function, and central banks had to step in and rescue the markets. So, uh, but I'm limiting my discussion today to the U.S. because. It's by far the most important treasuries market. Uh, the, so it's the lowest hanging fruit um, uh, to be addressed. Now, um, I I'm not okay, sure how we are for time. One more how question. Are we, time? Uh, we have another 15 minutes if you want. Good, good. Whatever. A, couple more, a couple more things uh, that I could 
discuss, but this would be a good time uh, to pause for any questions if there's anything pending. Uh, the, the question, which was another question by Kasdik Zata, is where's the Fed in this picture? Could it now step in and be a market maker, not only just buying it up, but essentially they really buy it up and, and pass it on to others? Okay, so there, in, in my view, there's two, there's actually three ways for the Fed to contribute to this. One is, even with this design, we could have, you know, another 1939 on the opening of the Second World War, another major epidemic, another major war where the Fed would, even with a much improved market structure, you would still want it to be available uh, to, to uh, restore the market to liquidity in extreme crisis. That's what central banks are for. Number two, and this might be controversial, uh, this CCP is not going to come easy in terms of capital and liquidity commitments. Right now, at the existing CCP, which is shown in this picture called the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation, there are already commitments in excess of $100 billion of liquidity by the clearing members uh, to handle the potential failure of a clearing member in case something were to go wrong. In an expanded CCP like this one, perhaps the dealers would be hard pressed to come up with the absolute tail risk amount of liquidity that could be required. And it might be the case that you would want the Federal Reserve available after all of the liquidity commitments of clearing members have been exhausted in an extreme event uh, to come in and provide intraday liquidity for treasury collateral, uh, similar to what it does as in the discount window for banking. So this is a potential role for the Fed here. And then finally, the main, the additional role for the Fed would be possibly to contribute uh, to the supervision um, of a facility like this and the regulation of a facility like this. So if the fundamental problem, as you pointed out earlier, is this one day delay in settlement, which takes up a lot of balance sheet capacity, what's about moving to a tokenization, going way more digital, where we just execute everything by the second, uh, would this make a CCP less relevant, or would this be an alternative? It, it certainly. I, actually, I had a, uh, when I wrote this paper, I got a number of commenters saying, "Well, what about T plus zero settlement or instant mm -hmm. intraday settlement, uh, so that we don't need to rely on uh, dealer balance sheets to warehouse these positions for a day?" Uh, there's two issues there. Uh, one is uh, that some of the use of dealer balance sheet is not just for settlement, it's to pipeline the positions until they're sold again. Now that's not directly addressed by central clearing, but as I mentioned, all to all trade would limit some of that uh, use of dealer balance sheet. The second concern is that there's a reason that we have T plus one settlement in the treasuries market, which is financing. This goes to your work on market liquidity and funding liquidity. When, a, when anyone buys a treasury, they buy it today and then they figure out how to line up the financing of that position before they have to pay for it tomorrow. And if you were to do T plus zero settlement, you'd have to have all of your financing arranged in advance, uh, even for the gross amount of purchases, let alone the net. Uh, and that would be very expensive to arrange in terms of commitment of liquidity, very expensive, at least for your shareholders. Now, it's not a social cost, but it's a, uh, it could be a social cost. If the, you've also written about the demand for safe assets. This would, this would increase the demand for safe assets quite, um, quite extensively. On the other hand, um, that's not to say that we couldn't use faster and uh, smarter settlement methods like uh, blockchain-based methods, and they are being experimented with now in a number of countries. That's a good question. So there are some other questions are concerning in your proposal, who has access to the CCP? How would you regulate access? Everybody or, you know, there are certain minimum criteria, but this might go in too much in detail. Uh, it's an interesting question. So the proposal, and I'm not the first to make it, is a broad mandate so that every active market participant would have to have their trades centrally cleared. So they would face the central counterparty for performance. That doesn't mean necessarily that there are going to be clearing members that are going to be responsible for managing defaults in the event that uh, some trades fail. Uh, that uh, would be most likely left up to the clearing, a much smaller group of 
clearing members, which would be the large dealers and some, perhaps some of the large non-dealer firms. And there's a distinction between the two that would need to be worked out uh, by a careful design and quantitative study. One of the things that I'm recommending uh, with this project is not, you know, let's do this tomorrow, but let's at least begin with a quantitative study um, of what would be the capital commitments and the liquidity commitments mm -hmm. and how much dealer balance sheet would be saved based on the transactions data that are now available through Trace, uh, unfortunately only to regulators at a transactions level. They've been promising to release those data to researchers like us, uh, but they haven't actually done it yet. Okay, if there's nothing else, I just want to mention one or two cleanup items. One of these is how much risk is there in the treasury's market? Would it, be, would it overwhelm a CCP? Well, not really. The one-day risk for a settlement of the 10-year treasury note, which is shown in red uh, in billions of dollars, this is for the whole market, is not as big as the one-day settlement risk on one single equity security that's currently centrally cleared, and that's the spider SP 500 uh, shown in blue. Now, this is in risk equivalent. So this is a settlement risk in the whole market. Uh, so the <laughs> blue is obviously bigger than red. It's possible uh, to handle this much settlement risk. On the other hand, individual treasury positions tend to be very, very large. And so again, not in terms of the amount of risk facing the clearinghouse, but in terms of the amount of liquidity that would be needed if a very large individual treasury uh, position had to be liquidated, that's a significant commitment. And as I mentioned, um, uh, that would possibly impinge on, on the clearing members in terms of the commitments of liquidity, which are currently in excess of 100 billion. Uh, the point though is, is, is that all of these commitments of liquidity are already happening in the bilateral market for trades that are not being centrally cleared. It's not the case that suddenly when you clear, there are additional requirements for liquidity. In fact, they might even be reduced by netting, but they would be crystallized at the CCP in terms of firm contractual commitments rather than discretionary on the part of the dealers who might say, well, if I'm not central clearing, I don't need to make that commitment anymore. The other issue, the last issue that I want to address is fails. Well, this is, uh, this means that you said you were going to uh, provide the treasury securities tomorrow, but you didn't actually provide them. Uh, and that's, that's, that doesn't mean that you're going into bankruptcy. It just means that your commitment rolls over for another day uh, with, a, with a penalty. And normally those fails, you would want them to be not too big. And in the first part of this year, they were on the order of 100 billion a day. Uh, the red bars are the primary dealer fails. Those are fails involving primary dealer transactions. And the FICC are shown in blue. Those are the centrally cleared fails. You can see that those fails soared in March as people were unable to deliver the treasury securities that they promised. And they soared particularly in the non-centrally cleared market. Those are the red bars zooming up to $500 billion. So um, a cent central clearing would presumably reduce the daisy chain fails in this market because when you know, a firm A fails to deliver to firm B, then firm B is likely to fail to firm C, which means firm C might be hard pressed to deliver the securities to firm D and so on. But if everyone is facing the CCP, then you cut those daisy chains because everybody is just delivering to one place. So that's, uh, that's the last the last uh, point that I wanted to cover, which is that central clearing can reduce these settlement fails, which would improve market liquidity, uh, possibly quite significantly during stress periods. Can I interject uh, several questions from the audience? So Terry Hendershot, you would like to know, you know, if there's a tragedy of the comments failure, why don't we just tax non-CCP trades, is this something legally feasible or is this out of there? And then uh, induce people to go to a CCP. So this is the, you know, quantity versus price, you know, Pigovian uh, approach or just mandate central clearing. Uh, let me give you one example that worked. The, uh, on, on the back end of the last financial crisis, 
the Dodd-Frank Act decided we have very little amount of central clearing in the US interest rate swap market, which is an even bigger amount of settlement risk than the treasuries market, uh, several hundred trillion dollars. They mandated um, by just by a rule, not by a tax, uh, the central clearing of all active market participants in the swap market with some exceptions uh, for standard derivatives. And now 91% of that market, around $100 trillion is centrally cleared. Uh, so it, it can be done just by a mandate. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are cases in which a tax might be more efficient. For, so for those that really find it very valuable not to uh, centrally clear, they might be willing to pay that tax. And for those that it's not that costly um, uh, to centrally clear uh, would avoid the tax. And so that, that's another approach. Nothing, nothing rules out uh, that way to implement it. So what the, the main objective is shown in the diagram, we just wanna get a lot of the trade in this market uh, netted down off of the dealer balance sheets or disintermediated away from the dealer balance sheets through all to all trade. So then but another the point, theory, by the way, has shown that competition in the interdealer market um, creates a dramatic improvement in market pricing in his uh, click per trade paper with Ananth Madhavan. Okay. Uh, you know that the treasury market is a very standardized market, but as of course off the run, off the run uh, bonds or treasuries. What would be the difference? Would the off the run win something on this? Do you think the spread would go down or do you have any implications on this or is this too difficult to predict what the off the run, off the run spread would do? And would it be more beneficial for the off the run? Um, Okay, so off the runs are almost exclusively traded between primary dealers and their customers. They're rarely traded in the interdealer market. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you were to introduce a broad mandate like this, um, it would be possible for non-dealers potentially uh, to face other non-dealers directly in trade and that would improve competition in that market. But I don't wanna suggest that the bid offer spread in this market is normally wide, it's actually a very deep and liquid market most of the time. It's just on these episodic events. So for example, when I showed uh, the bid offer spread, normally that, uh, that low level is extremely low. It's like a fraction of a 64th uh, of, of, uh, of a penny on $100. Uh, but uh, what, what central clearing would do would be to alleviate the uh, dramatic increase in bid offer spreads during stress periods and uh, reduce the moral hazard associated with everybody saying, well, no problem, the Fed can come in and rescue us uh, the next time uh, this is going to happen. Well, Joel Hasbrook had a question which, you know, I couldn't squeeze in fast enough, so I want to ask you now. You mentioned this auction the Fed implemented in order to handle this pressure. Who was allowed to participate in this auction? Only the primary dealers? Uh, yeah, uh, the primary dealers, the Fed normally uh, purchases uh, and, and followed its normal practice uh, purchasing from the primary dealers. It, it, uh, that's that's uh, the normal operating procedure for market operations of the Fed. So only, only primary dealers. So let me conclude with some bigger questions, if you don't mind. You know, there's a whole literature out there which says, oh, there's a shortage of safe assets. Uh, I must always, you know, the problem is asymmetric supply of safe assets rather than the shortage. Given that the Fed, uh, the, the US is expanding its debt level so dramatically, do you think this is now totally misplaced uh, that we don't have a shortage anymore? And the second question would be, you know, essentially, the Fed did huge amounts of QE without calling it QE. Is it because the intention was different? Does it have different implications? Or is it just as doing QE? It doesn't matter what the intention is, the announcement effects and all the other the channels through which QE supposedly works. Uh, is it different? And do you still think, if you look at the tips market, do you see the tips? My third question, is the tips also involved? And all the Fed intervention, does it distort potentially the prices and the infl uh, inflation break even point where you look out for 10 years and say, oh, the inflation expectations are 1.1%? Okay, These so are the final three questions, sorry. <laughs> let's start with the, the first one. You can remind me if I skip any. Okay. So the first one had to do with uh, the availability of sufficient amount of safe assets. Again, an issue that 
that you've written about in your own work. And uh, I think the best way to answer that question is to look to the case of Japan, which also has an enormous amount of uh, Japanese government bonds relative to GDP, far in excess even of, of that of the US. And yet uh, the Bank of Japan um, has purchased most of them. I mean, it's very difficult now to get liquidity <laughs> the market because the massive fraction of the JGBs that are owned by the central bank. So it's always going to be the case uh, that despite a massive amount of uh, safe assets, the central bank, if it wishes to, can step in for monetary policy reasons and absorb the flows. And uh, that's a cost in terms of the services provided by the securities to the market. Uh, but it's a benefit sometimes that central banks are willing to incur for monetary policy reasons. And the Fed is, is under discussion right now of doing yield curve control and of purchasing a, a much greater amount of these treasuries. My view is that those decisions should be made based on monetary policy considerations rather than having the central bank forced into the corner by market dysfunctionality. So the Fed should be left the option of whether it wants to absorb a large fraction of the outstanding amount of treasuries for monetary policy reasons with that trade-off of taking away safe assets uh, from the market. And that the trade-off should not be based on uh, the view that uh, we don't need to fix the dysfunctionality in this market over reliance on dealer balance sheets uh, because if the Fed can do it for monetary policy reasons, it could also do it to rescue the market as it has four times in the last century. I think not reforming the market is just taking away uh, policy space from the Fed and it's a uh, moral hazard in terms of um, the, you know, the private sector not, um, uh, not, not working properly is, uh, is just, uh, it's not something you want to rely on the Fed uh, to fix every time which as this diagram shows will be happening more and more often uh, in the future as you know, US treasury debt to GDP is now approaching all time record and uh, we'll go past it be before 2025. So the second question was, does it for the macroeconomy make a huge difference whether the Fed does QE with intention of affecting the real economy or it does QE just by being forced because of marketing dysfunctionality. Yeah, I, I had my own suspicions when I, I initial on the opening rounds of the Fed purchases, I was thinking, well, this is just uh, yield curve control and the Fed is labeling it liquidity provision, but really they're worried about yields uh, going up. And then in the course of doing the research for this uh, Brookings paper, I really discovered that it was about dysfunctionality. Um, uh, that is that the, all indications are uh, that had the Fed not taking, taken this much stock of treasuries out of the market, the market would have continued to be dysfunctional. In fact, there's still evidence of some degree of dysfunctionality. Uh, that, now, that's not to say that it might, the Fed might uh, have uh, viewed it as a useful byproduct uh, that uh, yields were kept to relatively low levels because now the, just the available stock of treasuries to the market is much smaller. Uh, but I think that's a separate, uh, I think that's a separate consideration, a byproduct. And going forward, as, as markets quiet down, we'll see what the, t the intent is of the Fed in terms of absorbing even more treasuries or doing yield curve control, which is under very active discussion if you're listening to, uh, for example, uh, President John Williams of the New York Fed indicating that this is a a good issue to discuss uh, 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 for the New York Fed in terms of its appropriateness for policy. But again, I another question which I couldn't, basis. I couldn't pick up from the audience. They wanted to know whether you think they will undo this huge purchases uh, very quickly. Finally, tips were tips part of these purchases as well, and uh, more than proportional to the outstanding tips. Do you know anything about that, or is this no? Uh, the information. <laughs> yes. The information is that most of the purchases were uh, traditional treasury uh, securities, relative, relatively short, uh, and uh, tips. Tips were not a big part of it. Um, all of these numbers include tips, by the way. 
uh, but tips were not a big part of it because uh, most most of the surges in demand for liquidity were not uh, tips related. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Daryl. This was a fantastic uh, tour de force to figure out what's going on in the treasuries market. And I hope that your proposal will change the whole treasury market. And I think it's probably, it's for sure an improvement for the better. And um, you're making a big difference here. Again, thanks a lot. And uh, I hope that everybody is coming back on Monday where we do quite a different economics of uh, racial disparity and other aspects, which is also very important for the country at the moment. Thanks, Daryl, and I see you soon over Zoom or some other media. Thanks so much, Marcus. Thanks for all the great questions from everybody. Talk to you soon. Thanks a lot to everybody for joining and for hanging out till the end and see you on Monday.